If you have your Bibles with you today, if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 20. If you'd like to grab one of the Bibles in the pew in front of you, in front of you, you can turn to page 1105. We're going, to be, we're going to be picking up where we left off in verse 17, Acts 20, verse 17. And this is after the riot in Ephesus. This is after he continued, Paul continued traveling. It's after what we went over last week where Eutychus was raised from the dead. And then we get to verse 17, and Paul calls the, the elders from Ephesus to come to him so he can speak with them. So reading from Acts 20, verse 17, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Be, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained by, with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. And therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified." I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all, they embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all, because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Father, I pray that in every person here there is joy because we have Christ and Father, if anyone does not have that joy, I pray that, that they would hear the gospel this morning. Father, I pray that, that your scripture would speak to us in a great way this morning as we cover this passage. I pray that, that you would preach it to all of us through your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for this family. We thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So
So we're going to go back and look through the scripture like we have in the past. We're going to start right at, back at verse 17, and it says that from Militas is how it's, it's pronounced in Greek, or you can say Miletus in English. It's about 30 miles away from Ephesus. So he's, they, they would have to sail to get to him. And so he calls for them. He sends for them to come to him. And they make, you know, it would be about a, it would take them some time to get there. So they traveled all the way to him. And he's being very, very serious when he's talking to him. It says that he called for the elders of the church. And this is one of those passages that, that we can traditionally grab to and we can say this is for the office of elders only. But I want to tell you today that that's not what he's saying here. He's talking about those who have time in the church, those of seniority. For you who have been in the church a long time, one way to think about this is, is if you've grown in the church, he's talking to you. If you're, if you're new to, to the, the faith, this is talking to you as well, because as you grow in Christ, these are things that you should take on as well. If you're familiar with um, the karate belt system, if you've been in the church for a long time or if you've been taking karate for a long time and you're still a white belt, the beginner belt, that's, that's very embarrassing. So I'm not going to call any of you out on this. You are, don't worry, you are safe. This is what I want you to do as we go through this. There are a lot of things that we're going to cover today as we go through this whole scripture. And I'm going to try to be fast so we can go home before tonight. And, but there's a lot of things here. And I want you to go ahead and, and think to yourself, how do I demonstrate these things in my life? Another way of looking at this other than a, a belt system is like baby milestones. It's a huge milestone when a, a baby learns to talk when they start eating on their own and feeding themselves, and when they start walking. And one of the things that we can ask about ourselves in the faith, am I actually speaking the word that I have received? Am I talking? Am I feeding myself with God's word? And am I walking and setting an example for those who come to believe? What are the milestones of your faith? If you have been a believer for any length of time, these all apply to you. He gathers these elders of the church around him and he, he starts to share with them. And the first thing we see from Paul as he's starting to tell them these things is that we are to lead by example, as Paul did. We are to lead by example. Today, among these things, there are 10 examples that I have pulled from here and we're gonna list all of them. So just so you know, we're gonna examine Verses 18 through 24. If you, have a, if you have a piece of paper or something you'd like to take notes with you, I'm going to try to, to give you enough space to write these down. But there are six examples of the 10 in verses 18 through 24. If you're someone who likes to write in the margins of your Bible, I do not. I tried it just this morning to underline some things, and it just really bothers me. That's not a holiness thing. It's God gave you this paper for you to learn his word. And so I like to highlight, I like to re-highlight, so I, use a, I like to use a digital form. But take notes, underline things as you go. There's a lot of stuff in here. And we really could cover this in many, many weeks, but we're going to try to get a big picture idea of what Paul is saying. And the first, lead by example. And the first example here we find in verse 18, he says, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia. You know how I lived. He's saying how I walked, how I, how I went and did about everything that I did in my life. You know from the time that I first set foot in your area. You know how I, how I operate. That's the first example he gives, how I lived. The second one is in verse 19. It says, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials. He, he was having to... to to go through all of these things. There was emotional trauma. There was real physical trauma that happened to him through the plots of the Jews. And that's the, that's the second example, serving the Lord with humility, tears, and trials. He was bearing the burden of the cross. He was taking up his cross as he continued. Example three we find in verse 20. He says, how I did not shrink. That word shrink means to strike the sails as they're coming into port. 
So he's saying, I did not slow down, I did not stop, I did not hesitate to teach you. And he says, teaching everywhere, teaching you in public and from house to house, everything you need to know. I was not hiding things from you when I saw that you, you needed something. I, to know something, I was not going to stop. That was his example. We, we, we fall upon that a lot. We, we, we don't do that. We see someone, we see someone struggling in their sin. We see someone where they need to be taught. They need to be brought up in the faith. They need encouragement. And we shy away. And we go, it's not my place to tell them anything. And we deny God his use of our lives when we do that. That's what Paul's example is here. To teach, no matter what's in public or house to house, we're going to teach people the works of Christ. Verse 21, we find example four, testifying of repentance and faith. And he clarifies here that he's testifying without bias. No bias here. Testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're to, we're to testify. That's his example that he has in here. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, he says. Constrained by the Spirit. That can also mean, you can take that to mean as chained to. As Paul writes in many of his letters, he says, I'm a slave to Christ. I'm a slave to Christ. So he's saying he's chained to the Holy Spirit. He's obeying the Holy Spirit. That's our Fifth example, obeying the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So he's saying, my life is not my own. I'm obeying God. Wherever God tells me to go, I go. So obeying the Holy Spirit. Note that what he says here, the Holy Spirit is not giving him warning of revival that's going to happen in the city. But warning him that if you go here, if you obey me, this is what you face. Our sixth example is in verse 24, when he says, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's saying, my example is in sacrificing my life for obedience. That's the sixth example, sacrificing my life for obedience. And as we talk about passing the baton today, there's part of that comes from setting the example. Setting the example. If you're in a relay race and somebody has come and given you the baton, then you're to run it so that the last guy knows to run the baton. To take that on, to demonstrate what Christ has taught us. To live the word of God. Do not be only a teacher, but a doer as well. So those are six of the ten examples we find in this scripture. The second thing we are to do, lead by example, the second thing we are to do is to teach Christ's commands, to teach Christ's commands. There are eight commands, there are eight commands that he gives to these elders from Ephesus. There are eight commands, and there are four examples that are tied in here with those commands. The importance of what Paul is saying, what he's commanding them, is conveyed through his life example. If someone tells you something of Christ, they tell you, I'm to follow Christ, you must do this, but you don't see them doing that. Does it seem important? There's an importance to not only teach Christ's commands, but to demonstrate them as well. So we're going to look at verses 28 through 35. We're going to continue there, and then we're going to come back to verse 25. In verse 28, he gives another he gives his first command here. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Pay careful attention. Examine the language here. As he continues through these commands, 
He's talking about caring for people over procedures or programs. He did not say to uphold these different things in the church, but he's talking to them about the care of the church, the people of the church. Because the church is not this building. It's not this organization. It's not this 501c3. It's not our programs. The church is the people. And so he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Keep a watchful eye. The flock, it says in verse 28, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. It's, it's not our church. It's God's church. And he's the one who paid for it. He says to watch yourselves and everyone else, to look over them. And he continues in those commands. He says in verse 31, to be alert. Why? Fierce wolves. I know that after my departure, this is verse 29, he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Now, when he's talking about these fierce wolves, a lot of times we like to think of people coming in from outside, the fierce wolves being all these different things of the world and all of these, these uh, things that we can get distracted by, that we can get pulled by. But what he's saying here, these fierce wolves are people coming up within the church to try to draw the church with them. See the, and you can find this, you can see these examples today because we, we see these all over, all the time. Because the truth of the gospel is only in Jesus Christ. And what we find coming up, when we see these fierce wolves come up from the church, they come speaking something besides the gospel of Jesus Christ. They speak all of all these rules, they speak of all this special knowledge, they speak of you have to have all of your doctrines right. If you miss one doctrine, then you don't have the true faith. But if you, it says, as we learned when we were going over this verse, that if we put all of our faith in Jesus Christ, then he has done the work. And so when they come up and they're trying to draw away disciples, they're trying to give religion instead of faith. Distorting the gospel of Jesus. And so he says to be alert, be watchful for this. Don't sleep on this. Because these are going to come up and try to draw away the church. The third command, he says, continuing on after be alert, the action that he says is to plead with everyone. And he gives his example, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day. So that's command number three, example number seven. I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. That's pleading. That's not, that's not beating them over the head with the Bible. That's pleading with them. You can take the, you can hear the care of in his heart for these people. It's not, it's not it's not, man, if, there were just, if we could just get rid of all these people, the church would be great. There's a genuine care. A genuine care. To the point of tears. To turn everything else away and only seek Christ. Command number four, he says, in verse 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he's passing the baton. He's saying, my job, my part of this has ended, and you are taking this on. And so he tells them to trust God and his word. Trust God and his word. That's our fourth command. 
I commend you to God and to the word of grace, which is able to build you up. Which is able to build you up. That's the word. That's part of, that's the part of eating where we got to take this word and we need to feed ourselves the word every day to pour over the scriptures and let, let it build us up and trust God in his work. Trust the word of his grace. Trust his gospel, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Our fifth command says, is do not chase riches or luxury. And it's also our eighth example where he says, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Don't chase after the things of this world. He's saying, don't get distracted. Don't let your eyes be drawn away from Christ. He said, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. These hands. He said, I was taking care of myself. He went, I wasn't there to just freeload off of people. I wasn't there to, to pretend like, like I was better than everyone else and they needed to serve me. He said, I was working. I didn't wasn't for gold. It wasn't for riches or to have nice things. But I worked for what I needed. And I worked, also worked to help others. And that helps. That leads into our sixth command. Take care of yourselves and others. And he has that example again, emphasizing the importance of this. I cared for my needs and others. In all things, verse 35, in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Again, hear the care in this verse. In all things I have shown you, that's an example, that is our our 10th example here. In all things that I have shown you, that by working hard in this way, we must, there's the command, we must help the weak. We must help the weak. That's the weak in the faith. We don't need to just scold them. It's also the weak, who are the, those who are physically weak, to care for them. And he says here, remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he says, himself says, said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We're to give more than we receive. We're not to be looking to come and get everything we can and to build ourselves up. But we're to be looking how we can give to others. How we can give to to others. I was actually convicted of this recently. And I was like, I spend a lot of my time doing things and trying to get things done and uh, sitting at, in church in Alabama and God really spoke out to me and said, you really need to be spending a lot more time in scripture because if you're going to be giving to others, if you're going to be teaching others, how are you going to teach stuff you don't know? And that really, that really hurt, my, hurt my soul there. He gives us these commands He gives us these examples. We see this as he's given these to the church. And don't excuse yourself from this, thinking I, following the culture that we have in our our church organizations, where if you're not in leadership, then this doesn't apply to you. Don't, Don't let that distort your view here. If you've spent time, if you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, these are things for all of us to to pay careful attention to everyone, to watch out for everybody to be alert for things that want to draw us away from Christ, to plead with everyone to continue to follow after Christ, to trust God and his word to build us up into who he wants us to be, to not distract, get distracted with the things of this world, the, the, the riches, the luxury, the, the things that other people have, to take care of ourselves and not freeload off of other people, but not only caring for our needs, but to care for the needs of others. And to work hard to help the weak, giving more than we receive. That's the message here, is to care for people, to love people. Through his, his example, through teaching, Christ commands. He continues on. 
And that leads us to our third point today. Encourage with grace. Encourage with grace. I, I love systems. I like computers. I, like the, I really wish I knew more so I could, I could automate things. I love automations. I love when things just work. It's one of my friends was telling me, laughing at me one day when I was talking about these things, and he said, you just like what's convenient. <laughs> A lot of times we get angry with people when they don't operate as we expect them to. We get upset. It aggravates us. I, I was mis- made the same mistake this week. A lot of times we are quick to rebuke and slow to encourage. A lot of times we're, we are way too quick to rebuke and slow to encourage. Know that Paul's words here in this, all of this scripture are about caring for people. They're about caring for people. You don't have to wait for a terrible day when somebody has lost something, whether it be a person close to them or they're just experiencing something terrible in their lives. You don't have to wait for a terrible day to encourage somebody. We can continue to build each other up with grace. We see in verse 36, as we continue here, when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. He was there encouraging them. He knew how hard this was for them to say that, this is the last time I'm going to see you. He knelt down and he prayed with them. He really cared for them. It says that there was weeping because they would not see him again. They knew that he cared for them. We're to follow his example. We're to encourage others with grace. And this is our fourth, this is our fourth point for today. We need to pass the baton. Let's look back to verse 25. He says, now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He says here, this is it. You're not going to see me again. This is it. He says, my work is done. I am innocent. Everyone is responsible for their own faith from this point because I've preached the gospel. They know the truth. And from now on, it's on them. I'm innocent of the blood of all because I did not quit. I did not slow. I did not hesitate. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I spared nothing. I've done my part. There are two large struggles that we're going to find here today. Maybe three. Some of us have yet to pick up the baton. We've decided that, you know, we're good with just sitting through and just letting things pass by us and we're like, okay, if I'm covered, all I need to do is show up and I'm good. Some of us need to pick up the baton. The other thing is that some of us need to be ready to pass the baton. Many of us are professional students of the Bible. We're professional students of the Bible and we never get out and do the work of making disciples. You don't have to be perfect You don't have to feel like you've made it or accomplished something or have gotten a degree to minister, to make disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. He said in in his commands, I commend you to God. I use you to trust God and his word to build you up. The apostles weren't perfect. Paul had a pride issue. Peter was constantly going, going back on what he said. We're not going to be perfect. But we're we're supposed to teach and lead by example. We have to continue 
to share. None of us are going to be here forever. Paul said that. This is the last time you're going to see me. And I can't, I can't stay. The Holy Spirit is taking me further. We're not going to be here forever. So when are we going to stop procrastinating? When are we going to stop putting off when I'm going to... I know I need to do this, but I'm going to wait. You know, okay, I'm, I'm going to stick with what I'm doing now, and then maybe when January 1st comes around, I'll stick with it. Okay, oh, maybe I'll wait until when summer starts. Once we get through this spring, that's when summer starts, I'll continue to follow Christ. Maybe, okay, well, summer's been absolutely insane. Maybe we'll just, I'll just wait until, until the fall comes and school starts back, and then I will commit to discipling someone. If you knew, if there was a timer that you had in front of you all the time that showed exactly how much time you had left in your life, how would you spend your time? And would other people know Jesus because of how you spent it? Would other people grow in their faith because of how you spent it? The, other, the last part of passing the baton is letting go. Letting go and trusting the other person to pick it up. Not only do you have to pick it up, not only do you have to take it, but you have to let it go. Part of training people is to let them do it. To let them take over. And to walk away. Paul, as Paul tells him there, this is, this is the last time you'll see me. He's like, I can't do it anymore. My work's done. I, this, is, this is for you to take. The newest, youngest generation, they're calling the nuns. N-O-N-E, because they claim no religion. When asked their religious affiliation, they say, I have none. Are we going to change that, or does the gospel end with us? Now, if you're here today and you don't understand the gospel and you want to know the gospel, let me explain it simply. We did a lot of things wrong, and we are separated from God, and there's nothing we can do about it. We cannot make ourselves right with God, so God sent his son, Jesus, to die for us, to pay our penalty, the penalty of our sin, so that we didn't have to carry it. And then three days later, after being buried, he rose from the grave, conquering death, that we may have everlasting life. And as we read in John 24, for all who believe in his name. For all who believe in his name. So we put our faith in Jesus, we entrust him with that, and we let him carry the load. Him carry the load of our sin. Maybe you're here today and you've gone through this like, like myself, and this is really beating you up. The beauty of grace is that we get to continue to try and try again. Trusting that Jesus Christ has already done the work. Part of trusting Jesus Christ is giving yourself that grace, allowing yourself to accept the grace of God. It's one of the things that I have to do over and over and over again because I'm I'm a professional at beating myself up. But if we leave here today and we take Paul's words as something to keep in front of us and to move forward with, we see Paul's example 
we see the commands, and we start to, to be a church that seriously loves one another, that seriously looks out for one another, holding to this most of all, that Jesus Christ is the only way. How can Christ, how can God, how can he use us for his kingdom? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so thankful for the work that you've done. Father, I praise you because it is only by your grace that I can stand up and speak here today. Father, we pray that you would give each of us in our hearts today love for others. Not just the the ones that we like or the ones we're sitting next to, but that we would really love without bias. We pray that you would teach us to extend grace with one another being quick to encourage everyone that we may plead with one another as we call each other back to Christ. Father, we pray that your word would be alive and active in us, that we would live out Christ's example and his commands. In all humility, in love, in joy, in peace, with patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, with gentleness and self-control. Father, build us to be a church that demonstrates your words, that they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. We pray that you would create that in us. Father, we thank you for the faith of the saints before us. I'm not here of my own doing. I'm here by your grace. And because you used one of your servants to teach me and to tell me the gospel of Christ. Father, we thank you for the faith of those who have come before us. And Father, we pray for the faith of those who will come after And Father, we ask that you would use us as your instruments for your kingdom purpose to raise them up in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the hope that we have in his wonderful name. It is in his name we pray. Amen.